Good morning. Did any of you take the advice that was given right at the end of the keynote last night? Drink a few glasses of water? Mm -hmm. Who wished that they had and forgot? <laughs> he had a few glasses of beer instead. Okay. Beer is mostly water. That's what the theory I'm going with. But anyway, and if I have to tell you when my jokes are, this is going to be a long morning. <clears throat> Technical excellence. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and a little bit about uh, where this talk came from. And um, so do any of you know these two guys? I might have briefly introduced them yesterday. But it's uh, Professor Peabody, the dog, and his boy Sherman. And they're in front of <clears throat> the Wayback Machine. And the Wayback Machine was how you learned history in the United States back when you were growing up in the 60s. This cartoon show was on every day. You'd watch it before school. So you'd learn something about history, always with a fun twist. <clears throat> But uh, in high school, a friend of mine showed me his punch cards and the punch machine. And so, you know, back in the 60s and early 70s, um, guys didn't type. My mom typed. My dad didn't type. I saw this. I'm in high school, and I thought, this is something to stay away from. Uh, closed room, no windows, raised floor, scary guy looking over the equipment. Stay away from that. But something happened. At the university, uh, we're studying calculus, and you've all, any of you people that have studied calculus, um, you've had to calculate the area under the curve, if you're in integral calculus, and then Newton figured out a way to come up with a formula for that by making these rectangles smaller and smaller and smaller. And so our professor wanted us to simulate Newton's method of making smaller and smaller uh, rectangles or trapezoids to calculate the area under the curve. And if you make that gap small enough, you've got integral calculus, which is great insight by Newton. Uh, and it was a fun thing to do on the computer. And something happened. I realized that someone would actually pay me to do this fun thing with the computer. And uh, my first job, I'm given this. And there are some embedded people in the world, but I mean in the room, I think. <clears throat> uh, so this was a, a device for communicating with the serial port. And my boss on the first day of work said, here, go figure out what this is. That's how I became an embedded systems engineer. Um, now, the computers that you would use in those days uh, might look like this. And you might say, what are all those switches for? Don't you just need an on-off button? No, what would happen with those switches is you'd toggle in the bit pattern and load memory with a bootloader so you could read from a floppy drive to get some, something in there. Hmm. Um, I never learned how to do that because the guy that was there before me knew how to do it. Uh, kind of primitive. And uh, if you made a mistake in your code, you'd have to take the uh, memory here, these little things with a little window there, and put them underneath UV light to erase them. Right? Oh, so this is a fast turnaround environment, isn't it? Yeah. Um, in circuit emulators, logic analyzers. We weren't so lucky as to have an extra serial port for putting out debug messages. We wished we had one. Uh, there was kind of a source level debug, uh, if you call assembly source level. Um, but we built something really cool with 16K of RAM and 16K of ROM, the first ever color weather radar display system for the FAA. Um, so this was kind of fun and just kind of an interesting thing to be involved in as a young person. When you make a mistake in, this, in a piece of code like this, it paints the screen a really lot of funny colors. <clears throat> Your bugs were very evident the instant you created them in that environment. Um, a couple of people asked me about uh, how I got involved in Agile last night. And I wonder if you're here because I said, you'll have to wait till tomorrow. Um, in the late 90s, uh, this was an interesting book that was around. Provocative name. I think if Kent Beck didn't name his book Extreme Programming, that uh, we probably wouldn't be here today. Because there would be, you know, the provocative sound of that name got people to look at it and say, no, that is horrible. Why would you do that? Everything is wrong. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the times in the 90s, but uh, some people said, how did you end up at the Agile Manifesto meeting? Well, a friend of mine, Bob Martin, some of you know Uncle Bob, of course, right? Um, we worked together in the 80s at a big company. <clears throat> and he asked me if I wanted to go to the Lightweight Methods Summit in Snowbird, Utah. Now you're saying, what's a white, Lightweight Methods Summit? And uh, the Lightweight Methods Summit was kind of the name that a group of people were going by that were kind of fighting against large processes or doing things against large. So we're doing a lighter weight way of doing software development. 
but the key word in this question from Bob was snowbird, and <laughs> you know, so at least I knew the right answer. Um, <clears throat> now back to the Wayback Machine. What were the 90s like? Uh, the 90s, at least in the circle I was in, it was kind of dominated by this book, Managing the Software Process, <clears throat> by Watts Humphrey. Anybody remember this book? Yeah? No? Okay, wow. Okay. You didn't know what uh, MRP was last night either. <clears throat> but uh, this was about if you had a better process, the people wouldn't matter. Now, I'm not sure if that's what Watts meant, but that was certainly the message we got, was if the process was better, the people wouldn't matter. You could go do these wonderful designs. I remember talking to somebody in Motorola, early 2000s. It's like, writing code is not a valuable skill. We're going to do all the design work in Schaumburg, Illinois, and then we're going to email that to low-cost producers of code, because code is not a valuable thing. Uh, we, there are plug-replaceable coding units over there in uh, China and India. And you know, maybe this isn't what Watts really meant to do. Um, but what was the state of the industry? Hmm, that's going to be distracting. I'll try to just ignore that. Uh, the industry, lots of delays, uh, defects. And you know, so what did this group of people get together to uh, talk about lightweight methods? What, why did they do that? Well, we wanted to find out what we had in common with a number of other people. I was part of the extreme programming contingent, having spent a couple of years doing extreme programming by this time. <clears throat> we tried to find out what we had in common. The first thing, though, uh, I believe uh, Ward said, we got to come up with a better name. Who wants to be known as a lightweight, right? <laughs> There was a company, there's a, any of you with uh, Agile in your company's name or your consultancy's name, just substitute lightweight and see how that works. Probably not so good. Agile was a better name. Uh, you know, so these four bullet points came out, which were finding what we agreed on and not what we didn't agree on, because we could have argued a lot about what we didn't agree on. The word software is in here because predominantly, let's see, developing software, there it is, rather than code. I think the first iteration had code because there are a lot of code-centric people in the room. And uh, there's a guy named Steve Meller that was there who was into model-driven development, and he kept fighting against the word code, and we abstracted into this. Um, but the interesting thing here, I'm just an engineer, but the first point, which is kind of surprising to me, was all this talk about people and the, uh, how people fit in. Because I was there, I thought extreme programming was just a better process, a better way of getting things done. And here's all this talk about well, you know, yeah, that extreme programming stuff is nice, but if you don't have a great team of people working well together, uh, you're going to have a problem. Yeah, you know, I said I, I'm an engineer. So, uh, um, well, I participated in the first ever Scrum gathering. Now, how many of you are Scrum masters? Okay, I'm going to have a little fun with you today, I'm sure. Are there any certified Scrum developers in the room? Okay. Uh, so there are several hundred thousand Scrum masters, right? And what's Scrum supposed to do? Maybe some of you people could tell me if I get this right, but let's see what uh, <coughs> Ken Schwaber says. <clears throat> Scrum exposes every inadequacy or dysfunction within an organization's product and systems development practices. The intention of Scrum is to make them transparent so you can fix them. All right. You're doing that, right? Fixing all those problems. Um, here's what this sounds like to me. In the 80s, we were learning total quality management. And a number of the things in Agile have a lot of, you know, I, th I don't know that people realize it, but the, some of these ideas, they've been thought of before. Um, structured problem solving. If we saw there was a problem, could we analyze it and decide what to do? Like bugs in code. I think pretty much the industry right now thinks there's nothing you can do about them. Um, <clears throat> maybe not to some of the people in this room. Uh, but plan, do, check, act. It means you're supposed to think about what you're doing. Now, here's what I see most often happening. Some of the steps get stipped. Get, some of the steps get skipped. Hmm. In the do cycle. Another cycle of what we did the last time. And if it's not working, uh, there's no one going to talk about that. And by the way, nobody wants to hear about it or see it anyway. Uh, there's been a lot of dogma following. Oh, the book says do it like this. Um, not enough problem solving. So as an engineer and as a people that are solving problems for your customers, 
whether you're a business person or not. What we're here for is to solve problems if what we're building doesn't solve problems. Following this process blindly is not going to lead to the right results. Um, Ken, paraphrasing, right, make the problems transparent so you can fix them. I wonder how we're doing at fixing them. Let's see, uh, I have came across this uh, David Dunning article quoting some of his work. Um, we think we're doing great. Company A, 32% of the engineers thought they were in the top 5% of skill and quality of work. Sounds kind of crazy. Uh, but Company B had 42% of their engineers thinking they're in the top 5%. So engineers, I'm going to pick on you for a while, too. Um, not anybody in particular in this room. Um, I like this statement. So much for being lonely at the top. It's kind of crowded up there in the top 5%. Um, if 40% think they're in the top 5%, 87.5% of them are wrong. I know this math is wrong uh, also. But uh, what's going on in our, in our industry? There's a lot of people... Uh, learning to program, and there have been, you know, for several decades now. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm sure some of you have seen this model before. There's a learning cycle that, or a, a learning progression that we go through. You might start as a novice. Uh, you might try to avoid something completely, and then you might find it might be fun. So you have a novice. You might become an, an advanced beginner as you start to develop an aptitude for programming. You might become competent, proficient, or maybe an expert one day in your area that you're into. Uh, what happens in the early days of this is kind of interesting. This is an article a friend of mine in the Chicago area wrote. Um, he noticed, and he talks about bowling. Now in the US, you know, the bowling game with the 10 pins. Uh, he said he got good at bowling really quick, but he hit a plateau. He couldn't get above 200 points, which would be amazing. I can barely get to 100. Um, so he got up to 200, but he couldn't get beyond that. And 300 is, you know, the pinnacle of that game. Uh, not many people even get those perfect games. Uh, but he discovered that you know, he was quite good at it, but he had some fundamental problems. And he couldn't get by them. So he was actually a guy that's kind of introspective. So he went and found out he was doing something wrong and trying to get better. But another thing that could happen is when you accelerate rapidly towards uh, being good at something, you might get this idea that you're an expert. If you don't see other people's work, if you're not looking at what kind of the current way or some of the new ideas so you could analyze them, maybe dismiss them, or trying new things, right? The learning that, um, you know, was uh, talked about all day yesterday. And uh, Joanna telling us about this learning activity that we have to do. So this can happen. You can get stuck. You know, if you're the only pro, if you work by yourself, and so many engineers work by themselves, and they do a code review to get the check mark on their process document, but they're not, doing that check, they're not doing that code review in a way with a short enough gap between when you wrote the code to when it's reviewed that you'll actually make changes. You get vested in what you've done. <coughs> so there's a risk that we can, uh, programmers can uh, pass the aptitude test, as I call it, and decide to go no further. What's the aptitude test? If you can get the app to work, you pass the aptitude test. Oh. All right, now, <laughs> aptitude, OK? Um, so if you can get the app to work, maybe you, have a pro maybe you have the aptitude to be a successful programmer or an excellent programmer, okay, but there's more to it. Um, now, a few years ago, I got an email from Alistair Coburn. He's, you know, part of the organization of the first Agile Manifesto meeting. There's a, a birthday party for the Agile Manifesto, and guess where it was? It was at the right place, so definitely I'm in. Um, and now, this was a much more structured meeting. And it was kind of a retrospective on Agile after 10 years. And there were facilitators. And you know, unlike just a bunch of nerds in a room, now nerd, I wear that. I would say nerd, not dork. Where's uh, Joanna? OK. Um, what was the outcome of this meeting? I remember the first two, because they've, they were rather important. Uh, to me, demand technical excellence. So the common theme of this group of people that brainstormed for a few days was, yeah, we're all going through these motions of Agile and Scrum and such, but we're not actually changing fundamentally how we develop to incre increase the quality, the technical excellence of our, of our development efforts of our people. And then there's the second item is, you know, how do we get this change to start to happen? Promoting that change and doing it ourselves, uh, trying to learn more. So what does Ken say about Scrum adoptions? Well, remember, 
we're supposed to make, make our work transparent so we can fix our problems. But unfortunately, many organizations change Scrum to accommodate their inadequacies and dysfunctions instead of solving them. Now, you might read that statement and think, you're not supposed to change Scrum. That's not, that's not what that means. Uh, Kent Beck, you know, in the late 90s, the big talk was CMM, uh, Capability Maturity Model, right? Where are, so where is extreme programming on the CMM? And Kent says, well, I'm not sure about the CMM, but level zero extreme programming are the 12 practices. So once you figure out those, the other levels don't matter because then you're going to start to do the right thing. Um, so there's a problem here. We're not doing serious problem solving. We still have, well, I ask yourselves, are you experiencing defects and delays and frustration? Anybody in the room have a uh, hardening sprint? <laughs> no one's going to raise their hand in this group. <laughs> The first time I asked that question, a bunch of hands went up because it's like, yeah, someone wrote about that in a book. That's a good thing. <laughs> no, uh, the bottom of the waterfall. Uh, any test people in the room? <laughs> Is it like this? I don't think so. It's more like this. Um, now, is it still like that, even at the bottom of the scrummer fall? Um, well, if, if as we're iterating, we're not testing as we go, and by test as we go, I don't mean just doing that demo at the end of the sprint. Ooh, that word, excuse me, I try not to say it. Um, I'll tell you why in a moment. <clears throat> if we're not testing as we go and not automating as we go, that means at the end some bad things are going to happen. Well, you know, yeah, we're going to plan on some bad things happening, and, and if they ended on time, that would be good. Okay, but do they end on time? No, usually something really bad happens, and... Uh, then we get to manage those defects. Do you want to have state-of-the-art defect management like I found by Googling for state-of-the-art defect management? You can have a process like this. <laughs> now, I would rather not have that. I don't want to have my work and... Oh, sorry. Come on. No. I don't want to have my, <clears throat> my work end like that. Why does it happen? Well, usually it's somebody else's fault. Uh, somebody did that. Oh, wait a second. Who's doing this work? Maybe we have to uh, take some responsibility. You know, so programmers, I did this with you yesterday. But would you stand up again, please? Any programmers in the room? The, the road to recovery. <laughs> All right? You did this yesterday with Code That Stinks. We're going to do it one more time. Um, repeat after me. I am a programmer and I write bugs. Okay, don't you feel better now? Sit down. Okay. Um, now, other people that didn't stand up, okay, realize that this is a hard job, right? It's easy to write bugs, so be understanding, okay? Uh, also, maybe, so this talk is uh, supposed to, you know, if you happen to be a developer that doesn't know about test automation and TDD, you probably wouldn't be in this room. Um, so if you didn't know about those things, I'd want you to have an introduction to them. If you're a business person, you're going to be going back to your team and they're not automating, they're not doing test-driven development, I'd like you to go back and say, you know, I heard about this thing, why aren't you doing it? Oh, we're chasing bugs right now, we're too busy. Well, maybe you could get proactive and, you know, we could take our time and learn how to do this other thing. So I'm hoping some of you uh, business people might take this back and say, maybe we want to change how we work, okay? Scrum masters, right? Coaches. Um, Hacking in new features and chasing bugs, this is not technical excellence. Jeff Sutherland says, the biggest problem with scrum teams is getting shippable code at the end of every <coughs> sprint. <laughs> they're so busy doing the steps of scrum, they're not paying attention to technical excellence. So with... Uh, with the adoption of things like Agile and Scrum and changing the cadence of how you develop and deliver your work, have you also changed the way you engineer your products? To think that we can engineer the same way we did with a big six month, only get uh, deliver once every six months versus delivering every two weeks, can we actually work the same? We actually couldn't do very successfully that six month delivery either. But what about this? Could we, do we have to change? So I'm proposing a marriage a marriage of the management practices of Scrum 
in the engineering practices of extreme programming. Now, I wouldn't be the first person to propose this marriage, but let's just see how the marriage is going right now. I have a feeling here it might be a little bit unequal. So here we've got 300 and some odd thousand as of 2014 certified <coughs> Scrum masters, and we have 54,509 certified Scrum developers. What does this say? <laughs> Do the math. Okay? It means it takes six CSMs to master one CSD. <laughs> All right. Now, you know, when someone goes away on a Scrum Master class and comes back with a Scrum Master certificate, and it was your project manager uh, person that did that, Scrum Master? Hmm. I wonder who the Scrum slaves are, <laughs> or what the programmers are thinking. <laughs> and then there's this word sprint. You've seen the Olympics. You know what happens. <laughs> and then you're helped back to your feet for another one. What, now what are you going to do next time for me? <laughs> now we've got to know the capacity of the group. <laughs> There's a lot of emphasis on, oh, could we just increase the velocity a little bit more? Oh, we need 15 points. You can get story point inflation. Oh, and then there's the burn down charts. Um, what are we burning down? Oh, now, let's see. So these, what I would say, dysfunctions in Agile are uh, kind of maybe more popular today than actual people that are benefiting from Agile. Uh, here's, you know, do any of you go to Quora and read the questions and such? Okay, so there was a question that popped up on my on my email one day, in a nutshell, why do developers dislike Agile? Uh, this question really should be, in a nutshell, why do developers hate Agile? You know, now, one guy who's got a lot of upvotes and a half a million views probably by now had a rant which was a true story, 100% true, of course, it was ridiculous, um, about why he hated Agile. And I wrote a little answer to it um, about, you know, Actually, you're getting it kind of wrong. All your things that you're saying, those are not really you know, part of what we had in mind. And now, looking at the numbers, I got 500 upvotes. He got seven times as many, six times as many. Um, number of views. So people are much more interested in the negative view. So I'm not saying anything about these numbers, aside from a lot more attention is attracted to the negative side. So look out, right? We've got to be careful. We've got to manage this change. Um, I was out to dinner with some people in Chicago a month or so ago. <clears throat> and uh, I said, yeah, too bad that so much of Agile is only, being done, only doing the easy half. And the guy looks at me and goes, which is the easy half? And I said, well, the easy half is, you know, uh, or no, he said, what's the hard half? And I said, the technical practices are the hard half. And he goes, oh, no, they're not. The hard half is the people, the people half. It's like, you know, I'd, I'd said this, these words a number of times the first time someone challenged me on it, and uh, probably not because no one ever thought of it before. And I've been thinking about it during dinner, and it's like, hmm, move over, iterative development and uh, technical excellence. What about this respect for people thing? Now, <clears throat> I'm just an engineer, so this part, you know, I got into it because I thought it was a better way to work. Um, but this teamwork thing, <clears throat> if I look at those negatives on Quora and the negatives I hear in other places, it could be because this people side is really the hard part. <clears throat> and we need some work. Now, but I'm an engineer, so I'm going to get back to the engineering stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's this uh, book I picked up a while ago, Debrief Imperative, another way of thinking about retrospectives and how the US military does them. And what I started to do with my training classes, <clears throat> definitely have a frog in my throat. Uh, my body's used to being asleep right now. <laughs> okay, so um, before my training classes, I'll have sent out a survey and ask people, well, how do you work? What do you do right now? How much time do you spend debugging, for instance? coding, testing, debugging. And if I look at the answers, I'll see <clears throat> a wide variety of how much time do we spend coding. And if I look across, we'll see, you know, here's someone spending most of their time debugging, a little bit of time adding value, right? If, 
if we did a value stream mapping, debugging wouldn't be seen as one of these uh, value addition steps. It would be a, a waste step. And so we'll see uh, several of those, and then there'll be somebody that'll have a, a high number, like 60 in the uh, adding value. And usually that's the person who started doing test-driven development on their own. They might have bought my book uh, or somebody else's and started to do this, and now they're, they're seeing some good results. Now they want to drag the rest of their company along with them. You know, so I would ask you to reflect, and how do you test your code? Uh, and I asked these people taking my training class, how do they test their code? And they tell me about debug statements, and they tell me about printfs and looking at what's going on and single stepping with their debuggers and using logic analyzers that now are built into your computer rather than a separate equipment and a, a simple little dongle here for getting access to your processor. So I'm talking to embedded systems people and I'm thinking, hmm, these tools look very familiar. These are the tools I grew up on, right? Very primitive tools and I congratulate them. Congratulations. You are using 1979 state-of-the-art development practices. Okay, so there goes those animations again. Um, right, so we, we celebrated just for a moment, or not. Yes, there we go. 1979 state-of-the-art development. Has anything changed since then? Um, we're still doing debug later programming. When you write a book about test-driven development, you've got to have something to call the other way of working. So I call it debug later programming. Um, another question in Quora came by. How many times a week do you use a debugger? And one guy answered it. Every time I'm coding. How else would you know what your code is doing? Well, there's other ways to know what your code is doing. Um, John Gall, The Systems Bible. Okay, this is a great little book. I highly recommend it, especially if you're going to do any talks and now someone's going to start using some of the quotes in this book, but uh, there's lots of quotable items in here. Your program will have bugs, and they will surprise you when you find them. So here's the guys at uh, the Commit Strip comic, and they're celebrating their uh, release, having the champagne, and a bug comes and spoils the party, and one of their lead developers samurais, or is that hacks, I'm not sure, hacks the bug into non-existence, and now they're ready to get back to their party, and... They're surrounded. And some of these bugs look pretty confident that they're not going to be found for a long time. Uh, where do they come from? Someone else did it, of course, right? It's not our fault. Um, you put them there. You might not know you put them there. Uh, oh, and there's this thing I love. Next time you're listening to the news and they're talking about some software failure, they're going to talk about glitches. Glitches, right? Oh. An emissions glitch with VW. Hmm. Okay, yeah, we know more about that one now. Um, uh, you know, as a traveler, when, I, when Boeing discovers a glitch with their power unit that means go to safe mode, uh, which means shut off all power, um, it doesn't make you really comfortable thinking there's a lot of software behind this stuff. So, uh, glitch? Really? Okay, so I, I object to that word. Um, it's as if there was some quantum mechanical effect going on that we can't really be responsible for it. It's something out of our control. No, let's take responsibility. I'm not going to make you stand up again, but you know. Um, we put them there. Uh, let's see. How, how does it happen? What, what could we do different? So I'm really amazed at uh, Kent Beck, Ward Cunningham and company that they could actually see beyond debug later programming. If you do development followed by tests, you're going to find problems. You're going to find the problems, but unfortunately, you don't find them all. This is very unfortunate. So the physics of debug later programming. Well, it's human to make a mistake. Right? This is we're something that we are really good at. We excel. Um, now, sometime later, the mistake is discovered. How long does it take to find the root cause of a bug? So imagine that you wrote the code three weeks ago. And now you're finally getting around to, and you, there's a report from QA about a bug. Or you wrote the code this morning. Or somebody else wrote the code four years ago. How long does it take to find that root cause? It could take quite a while. The fix might be very simple. It might be one missing semicolon or an if statement that's backwards. 
Now, if that code had been around for a while and you fix it, what's going to happen? It won't be a good thing, will it? No, it's likely going to cause other problems. So we have to be really careful. Uh, if you're interested in this article, there's a, I'll be posting my slides on my website later and, and give a link to the, uh, to the conference. Um, but there's an article about this if you want to socialize it with any of your colleagues. Um, what I would like us to aspire to as, as engineers and as uh, people build, building products, if we want more effective programmers, they should not waste their time debugging. They should not introduce bugs to start with. What an idea. Edsger Dijkstra, I wish you were alive still to tell us how to do it. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you've read any of his work, he was trying to figure out how to do this uh, through formalized proofs and such and didn't really leave us with a solution. I think there's a solution in our grasp, though, kind of like Newton was trying to calculate the area under a curve using smaller and smaller rectangles. Maybe something like test-driven development could approach this thing. Maybe not perfectly, but could approach what Dijkstra is talking about. So now back to the marriage. What is this extreme programming stuff? Do your developers, you business people, know about these practices, these engineering practices? What we're going to do is take the, back in the 90s when Kent wrote the book, we're only turning the knobs up to 10. Uh, but since uh, the movie Spinal Tap, we've got to crank them up to 11 now. Um, <laughs> if quality is important, it's not something that we just have a department for. It's something we have to do every day. If testing is a good idea, we don't just do it at the end. We do it every day. If reviews are a good idea, we don't just do them at the end to get that check mark in our ISO 9001 form. We do them every day in the form of mob programming or pair programming. <clears throat> If the customer is uh, communicating with them is a good idea, let's have one nearby so we can talk to them and find out what they really meant. If planning is a good idea, let's replan. Let's keep the plan alive. A plan does not survive uh, first contact with the enemy. At the core of the engineering practices of extreme programming is this thing called test-driven development. And I saw a lot of hands go up yesterday when I asked about that. Uh, what does it do? Business people, why, do you, why should you care that your developers do this? Well, there's a step here in the middle called refactor, improve the code. The code you have today is not suitable for what you're going to need in a month. It's going, the needs will change. In a year, it's going to change again. Your code must be continually renewed to be able to handle new unknown requirements that are coming. So there's this refactor step. There's going to be regression tests that are created uh, virtually for free as you do this test-driven development thing that will help you keep your code working. So instead of a waterfall, Think of adding new features as a fast-moving stream. When a new feature is added, it stays working until you change your mind on how it should work. If it stops working the way you intended, a test will fail and say, hey, this doesn't work the way you want it anymore. These unintended consequences. Just like the long lines at the water. You guys all have these nice big watering bottles. I heard about there's a new unintended consequence at this conference, which is going to have to be fixed next year when we do the retrospective, right? Uh, these water bottles are too big, and you're all hogging the water coolers now. Um, you have to solve that problem. Unintended consequences. So what if we could get code developed, features added, and they stayed working? Well, it, you don't do it by writing all the tests first and then doing all the code. You do it by doing this test-driven development thing. You're working in a tight feedback loop, working in small steps. Oh, small steps are for babies. Oh, no, they're not. They're for experienced people to get things working. How, do the, how does the physics of development change if you were to behave this way, if you were to develop your products in small increments? Well, we're still going to make mistakes. We're still going to make mistakes. But guess what? The mistake will be put right in your face. Now, I used to think I was good at programming until I started doing this. Now, any nodding heads from programmers that have experienced the same thing? It's like, oh my gosh, how many mistakes per hour do you make? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say my number, OK? It's probably a bigger number than, than you would be willing to admit. Um, if it was in the work you just put in, you could take that work out in your code. All the prior existing features would work. If I, if I took it out and I put it back in, I could see maybe I could get some insights of what I did wrong. Maybe I could fix the problem if it was only the things that were broken in the last five minutes. Fixing might be quite easy. If my new feature works and some random other thing breaks, ah, now, this is when you get addicted. Now, some of you might have experienced this at some point. I experienced it about 18 years ago. Oh, hmm, I forgot about that. There's a lot of details in code. 
I can back out my change and try again, rethink it. We just eliminated a huge variability in our development uh, effort, this searching for defects. I'm not saying you're not going to have to search for them anymore, but what if you search for them a lot less? Oh, let's see. Oh, that toaster's broken. Let me fix that for you, Mom. It's going to be easy. It just takes two seconds to patch that one. That story didn't end well. Um, why should I learn these new ways of working? I've, I'm successful. I've been doing programming for 10 years. We've got a successful product, 10 years' experience. That's a natural water break. <clears throat> I already know how to program. I'm an expert, beginner. I passed the aptitude test. Uh, you know, so let me ask, does your turn, uh, team do TDD? Do you, do, you, do you create tests? What's this big deal about tests? Why do you care so much about tests? <clears throat> and oh, by the way, uh, you can write tests after. It's not as much fun. Uh, test driven, actually, people that get hooked on it, they find that it's fun. Now, the testing pyramid came up yesterday. and I. I'd just like to show you the roles of different kinds of tests. And at the base of the pyramid, I like to show is a bunch of solid bricks. Because what a programmer is going to do is create a solid thing that does exactly what the programmer thinks it's supposed to do. Now, that might sound like a weakness. It does what the programmer thinks it's supposed to do. That's actually the best the programmer can do, is get, to get code to do what you think it's supposed to do. Um, now, it doesn't prove it's right. Oh, we're going to put all this effort into something that doesn't prove we're right. Hmm, this sounds like a problem. But the next layer up of tests is about, are we building the right product? So you people in, uh, that are writing cucumber tests or fitness tests or whatever, you're working at this next layer up. Does the business logic work? And then you, of course, have to touch the system as well. Um, in embedded systems, it might mean a user interface or it might mean a network connection or it might mean some sensor. But anyway, you have to have in the real environment that the code's going to be in. So uh, because of these different things, what can we do? It's like, well, could we just write those user tests? Could we just write the, the tests that say we meet the requirements? And I think that that's not going to work out so well because it's a numbers game. Uh, if I had a really complicated system with three collaborating modules with 10 states each, how many test cases do I need to fully test this really complicated system? Wait, really complicated system? This isn't so complicated. Uh, if you do the math, you need a 1,000 tests. If I test these three things together to test it thoroughly, we're not going to do that. That's too much effort. Unless I could generate the test. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't sound like the thing to do. Uh, what if I decided to unit test the pieces and exercise every path through this code? Oh, now I need 30 tests. And I need some tests to make sure I've hooked everything together because, you know, the code compiles and builds is not good enough. Um, <laughs> there's a few test cases that we might want to run here just to make sure we've hooked everything together properly. Um, OK, so I would like to encourage you, unit tests are important, as are higher level tests in the many forms that they might come in. Manual test is a losing proposition. So I've got this, these models here that you can take back to your organizations if you want to help socialize these ideas. A manual test is not sustainable. Now, I've, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, your organization is structured as if what I'm going to describe here is true. Your organization is structured as if the effort to develop something is proportional to the effort to test something. And I say this because you're probably relatively flat in your organizations. The number of people in your test department or the number of months you plan on doing testing every year is probably kind of fixed. And the amount of time that you're spending doing development is fixed because that's how many people you have. Okay, but what happens? Um, systems don't like being changed, like bringing water bottles to a conference. The system broke in some unanticipated way. So we gotta be careful when we're changing a system. Systems don't like being fiddled and diddled with. Um, this book is, uh, the subtitle is <clears throat> The Study of Systematics. Sounds like a serious word, doesn't it? Uh, but actually, it's not all that serious. Well, system part is serious, but then the second part is actually antics. So John Gall's got a nice sense of humor. 
So, you know, I feel sorry for the photographer yesterday um, trying to herd all the cats, but you've tried to take this picture before. And this picture, you know, this family does not, this family system does not want to cooperate as much as you yell, okay? I, not that I ever had to do that. Um, but because systems act up, we have to be careful. And the second iteration, we must retest everything in the first iteration. In the third iteration, we must retest everything in the first two. In the third, you can see where this is going. And I think I'm being very kind in drawing this as a linear slope, because I think it's probably worse than that. What's happening here, though? If we're using manual tests as our approach, we can't keep up, unless you're adding new people that actually know what your product's supposed to do every two weeks or whatever your iteration length is. Uh, you're building up risk in the untested code gap, and eventually lightning strikes and something <coughs> bad happens. So why does code quality matter? It looks like I've got about five minutes left here. Code quality matters because um, <clears throat> getting code working is one thing. Keeping it working is one thing, but um, any fool can write code the compiler can understand. Good programmers write code that other humans can understand. If we're going to be maintaining this code for a long time, we have to make it so that it's maintainable. Just working isn't good enough. Right? Now, I'm, I'm wondering how well this works, but at least for the test cases, it, you know, I don't know, the dog can't get through this hole. I think air does, but... Um. And then there's another problem that our industry is going to face as software failures become more, pu more public, the lawyers are coming. I have some friends uh, who are the expert witnesses for the uh, Toyota case. And some of you might know about the unintended acceleration that the Toyota um, cars were having. And um, I understand that there's still a lot of cars at risk out there because Toyota has not admitted uh, any fault and has not done a recall. So there's code out there in your Toyota that might cause it to unintendedly accelerate. In talking to one of the guys the other day, he goes, if this happens to you, and I happen to have a car where it could happen to, it's in the right range rage, he said, don't do the usual stuff of just putting on the brake and, and that sort of thing. Uh, start fiddling with other stuff in the car to try to get the control loop back <laughs> in the engine. Because the engine lost its mind and the thing that said, oh, we've got cruise control on, we should be accelerating, and also decides to engage the ABS brakes, has lost its mind. And so you're going to continue to accelerate $1.1 billion class action suit. Now, if you don't think that's going to get the attention, oh, but I don't do embedded systems. What, what does that have to do with me? Yeah, you want to write this website about how to collect your $1.1 billion? Okay, uh, don't think we're not attracting the attention. Here's some news about a bill being introduced to con Congress about uh, safety standards. Oh, okay. There's blood in the water. The lawyers are going to be coming in. Developers, if you don't want to be led around like this, we need to get our act together. So I know my friend Uncle Bob is uh, saying a lot of the same things. We need to be professionals at how we do our work. Otherwise, this is going to happen to us. So let's see. Why don't you do these things, I wonder? And what's in your way? And if you don't, if you, just excuse me for one second. Um, I was talking to some guys on the beach last night, and they said, yeah, we couldn't possibly do these things because we do embedded systems. And uh, we couldn't do this TDD refactoring thing. Our hardware has kind of got some problems. And uh, it's got small memory, like Homer Simpson's tiny brain, or like this watch or this pacemaker. But you know, sometimes there's memory that's big, like a GPS or an iPhone or a large hadron detector. And we couldn't possibly use extreme programming because we have constraints, like time. And if our pacemaker misses its deadline, that's not all that's going to be dead. You can't use extreme programming for embedded systems. We have special problems. I always specialize, like this washing machine, a room before cleaning robot, or this pacemaker, or car, or large hadron detector, and the prototypes are expensive. And they've got bugs. And whose fault are those bugs? It's kind of hard to tell. And we've got specialized UIs. And oh, I could go on with these excuses. Uh, I'm going to run out of time, though, if I do, because the excuse list goes on and on and on. Um, you are special, all of you. <laughs> it just doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I told you I was an engineer. I'm not one of those people guys. OK, so we have other people in the room to do the people stuff. <clears throat> Could we be problem solvers over dogma followers? Right? 
the three halves of Agile. I know the math doesn't add up. And as an engineer, it bothers me a little bit. But um, this respect for people, right? Micromanaging, uh, having scrum slaves, sprinting, and you know, focus on this. Make sure we've used every ounce of capacity on this truck there. Um, technical excellence is not just getting it to work. Um, there are no shortcuts to success. <laughs> now, what's really fun, if you read the back of this, if you read the back of this truck, our most valuable resource, it's not an agile company, obviously, because they've got resource on the back, unless they're talking about the, the diesel fuel in the gas tank up there. Um, we are what we repeatedly do. So what's interesting about iterating is you don't have to buy into everything all at once forever. You get to experiment. And you should be experimenting. You should be learning. It's a habit you'll fall into. Um, if any of you are interested in learning about TDD, I'll say my shameless plug, I'm going to be offering uh, TDD training in a number of countries around Europe in the, in the uh, spring. And plus, I do some over the web. But you could contact me about that stuff if you're interested. Here's my contact information. And look at that. There's an extra minute, if my watch is right. <clears throat> Any questions? Well, thanks for letting me have fun with you then today.